and take it away, Philip. Um, thank you, Steve. And uh, we'll maybe go through with the question time about theory constraints, lean and six sigma. The simplest way of uh, doing theory constraints these days is to call it lean, but I'll, uh, I'll come back to that. Um, thank you, thank you for, your, for being here. Um, I'm going to talk about applying the theory constraints to um, the aeronautical sector. Uh, a very simple uh, outline, an introduction, three cases, uh, and uh, a conclusion. Uh, don't worry about the timing. The first case is going to take up at least half the presentation, and the last two will be going through quite quickly. Okay, I'll, I'll concentrate on the first one. Okay, so uh, fasten your seat belts, uh, seat in the upright position, and off we go. Um, my name is Philip Maris. I live in Paris, France. Uh, I have the, the dubious uh, honor of being one of the uh, oldest uh, active theory constraints practitioners since uh, I was hired by the strange Israeli physicist called Eli Goldratt and his brother Is Isi Pascal by a software company called Creative Output uh, in 1986. The guy had just published a novel, you know, some sort of very strange thing. And uh, anyway, uh, I was one of these people who got the theory constraints bug a long time ago. I've been doing it for 29 years. I've done it about 150 times. Uh, I'm a horrible consultant, so uh, warning, you must assume that everything I'm saying is a lie. Uh, I created my own company 10 years and five months ago. Uh, and we uh, implement uh, essentially sort of 100% theory constraints, sometimes called lean for political reasons. But uh, <laughs> no, it's true. We we have a you know critical chain programs are called lean engineering and uh, stuff like that. It doesn't, so I'm I'm happy with that as long as you know we know what we're looking for constraints and handling them. Um, and I, I give conferences and stuff. I've written a very boring French book uh, about uh, you know you like the goal, uh, why don't you implement it? Uh, another thing I do, by the way, is quite a lot of work on uh, the marketing and awareness of theory constraints because Eli did say uh, in many places, including It's Not Luck, that people just don't do enough marketing, uh, especially in business to business. And I think that's a weakness, a big weakness of the theory constraints community. I'm very happy that uh, Jana Purcell has joined TOCICO to, to boost that because uh, people know the goal. They don't know much the existence of the theory constraints. Right? They've all read the goal. Uh, how many? Well, I won't ask that one. But uh, so you know, it's a pity. Uh, we should all be communicating, communicating a lot more because uh, there's a lot to say. And uh, you know, if you have internet and you Google it, uh, you'll find you know we're not very visible given uh, the power of the ideas. Anyway, I I do a lot of that. Uh, about 45 minutes a day. Uh, otherwise, I, I slap myself in the face. Uh, I run five permanent news websites uh, on Scoopit about the theory of constraints. Uh, we have a video channel, which we're uh, growing and growing. It's now got 80, 80 uh, videos. I run some discussion groups on critical chain and, uh, sorry, uh, th theory of constraints plus lean plus six sigma. Um, I have two dedicated websites about talking production and critical chain, but they're in French, so you have to learn French first. Uh, and uh, active on all the rest of the stuff, the Twitters, the Facebooks, and whatever people will be using in, in one year's time. Just for my information, because quite a few people have come up to me and said, oh, I follow you on that. How many people here know and look at my, our Scoopit sites? Okay, so it's about half of you. How many people have looked at the videos? About a third, okay. Anyway, uh, have a look or ask somebody if you think it's worthwhile. It's, uh, I, they're permanent news websites, right? Uh, as I say, I try to do it every day. You'll find that uh, uh, the comments by uh, Rami yesterday, or the day before yesterday, about uh, Ronnie's thinking processes are online. Uh, the Victoria University stuff is now online and so forth. I try to keep it very up-to-date and fresh. Uh, it's uh, quite a difficult exercise, but uh, we do that. Uh, case A, uh, flight control systems. Flight control systems are the thing where you hope that when the pilot pulls the stick, the plane goes up, you push it down, it goes down, left and right, okay? Um, so uh, this is a case in one of, a very, one of the very largest uh, European manufacturers of uh, aeronautical equipment, uh, engines and stuff. Uh, it's over 5 billion euro sales. It's got over 30,000 people, 60 factories. Uh, and uh, they asked me to come into what was their worst 
factory within 60. For those who know aeronautics, we agree that it's a little bit more sophisticated than that diagram, right? Which is sort of the Wright Brothers stuff. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> you know, it's, luckily it's not cables and things like that anymore. But uh, anyway, um, I, I could just see a few people saying, what, what's that strange diagram? Uh, at least, uh, anyway, they, they, they had just one very, very bad factory, right? Which had due date performance that was a, a lot uh, publicly. Uh, they were on new business on hold from uh, Airbus and everybody else because uh, that was just stopping all the production lines and you know you can't sell a plane that doesn't have that function right uh, so it was getting very very hectic uh, they tried lots and lots of things this was an old problem at least 10 years old they tried you know the McDonald's uh, consultancy firm they spent two million euros two years in there for a 400 person plant that's a lot of money uh, and that had only just made things worse and uh, so, you know, they thought, what can we do? We've tried everything. Let's try this stupid, silly thing, you know, the theory of constraints or whatever it's called, and off we went. So in I go. Uh, one of the beauties of the theory of constraints is that it's quite easy to very quickly, because of the focusing power of the, thinking of, uh, the theory of constraints, to, to work out what's going on. Uh, so we did uh, a, an audit, a diagnostic in a day and a half. Uh, what did they say? Uh, they said, well, I said, why are you late? They said, well, we have, you know, we don't have enough capacity. Okay, uh, where are your bottlenecks? Well, we have 12, they said, in fact, but well, they said 12, let's have a look. And they, after half an hour, they said, okay, there were five real ones. Okay, uh, fine. Um, so we're we'll going to have a look at those. Uh, what else is going on? And they showed me some figures. And, I said, and they said, we have nine months uh, work in progress and lead times. Now, these things, you know, not much more complicated than a Hoover or a car alternator. I thought, nine months to make a thing like that? There's something strange going on. What was going on? We'll see. Uh, anyway, so they had these bottlenecks. They, had a, they could spend any money they wanted, right? Any whatsoever. Uh, so they had full overtime. They had contract workers for 35% extra labor. Uh, subcontracting to the outside. Anything that they could uh, lay their hands on, they would subcontract. Uh, they were buying lots of new, lovely machines that could uh, go and buy the coffee and, and stuff. Uh, management attention, there was overdose. Uh, everybody from the board down to anybody else, the clients and so forth, there were at least uh, 12 extra managers in the plant at any one time uh, yelling and screaming and stuff. So there was a lot of management attention in there. All this because they had these bottlenecks and, they, and whatever. And uh, the top management got very tired of these diagrams, uh, which came out of SAP, which was the capacity load from the uh, SAP system, which said, you know, we're late at the moment, but within two months' time, we will catch the backlog and everything will be okay. But they'd been saying that for five years, and the top management was a bit sick of this. So they said there must be something else going on. Okay. Uh, and the nine months, well, it's quite, quite simple. Uh, obviously, nobody in this room has this problem, but it happens. Uh, they were overdue. They were about uh, at least two weeks overdue on average. So they said, right, since it's two weeks overdue, we'll start work two weeks earlier. So they increased the lead times in their SAP and s launched everything two weeks earlier. That increased the queues, which increased the lead time, and so they were still two weeks late. So two months later, they said, what can we do? Let's increase lead times by another two weeks, and so forth and so forth. And that's how they got up to nine months to make you know, something which was pretty simple, really. Anyway, so tell me, guys, uh, what's going on? They've identified the bottleneck. They're exploiting it. They've spent all the money they can. Why is nothing happening? They have too much in whip. We agree. Okay, but so. Right. Yeah, they should be reducing their whip and their lead times, but they're not because they're overdue. So, what's the problem? They have buffers everywhere. Yeah, they they sure do. Yeah, yeah. There was, you know, uh, and it's quite expensive. You do these little things in titanium and stuff. It, um, uh, it's a, they had 32 million euro. Anyway, I won't. Get, I can't give you all the figures, but there was a. It wasn't just you know getting in the way. It was quite expensive stuff. What's the problem? Why they 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 identified the bottleneck? They weren't really overproducing. The, the finished goods was not that high. Yeah. Well, they've, you know, they, they didn't know, they didn't, weren't applying the theory of constraints, but, you know, common sense. Where are my bottlenecks? Here they are. Let's make them produce them as much as possible. Touch time about uh, between three and five hours. 
Well, no, if you add heat treatment, let's say two days to be kind with them. Of course, yeah, well, everybody focuses on efficiency. So, yeah, I mean, but why, why weren't they catching their backlog? You know, they could spend all the money they want. They had the bottlenecks identified. Come on. Oh, the priorities would change about every 12 nanoseconds. <laughs> yeah, you know, which do you do the, the, the order which is very late or the, important, the, the order for the very important client? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Come on, what's the problem? <laughs> they had more than 12 managers. <laughs> Come on. <coughs> this might invite, to, uh, invite you to the uh, conference I'm giving tomorrow. The problem is they got the bottleneck wrong. It wasn't there. These people, uh, running around like chickens with their heads chopped off, uh, spent their time frightened by top managers and clients like Airbus and others coming down and hitting them on the head saying, you, you just shut my line down again. And they, were, they, they just were completely lost and playing around with their SAP, doing all sorts of silly things. And the crazy thing, and you're going to say, this, I'm not that bad, was that if you went into the factory, there were two parts, uh, machining and uh, assembly, right? There was a corridor between the two. And down that corridor, just in a the corner, there was uh, quality control. And right down the main corridor of this factory, it was it, the, the, the whip reached the ceiling. Behind there, but that glass window there, is quality control. It was the bottleneck. Obviously, it was the bottleneck. 37% of the whip was, in fact, in front of the bottleneck. But SAP doesn't manage quality control. Quality control is indirect. It's not in the routing. There's a time, no capacity management. And so these guys were just looking at SAP and the data and working on the non-bottlenecks. And to feed the non-bottlenecks, you need WIP, and so you go you know, efficiencies and stuff and so on. Okay? And it's as simple as that. Now, again, just a, a little... Uh, kick to see if you can come to, you want, might want to come to uh, tomorrow's conference. Eight times out of ten, the people I've been meeting in the last ten years have got the wrong bottleneck. Okay? So the theory of constraints is fine, but if you apply it to the wrong bottlenecks, nothing happens. Okay? So, what, that's it. That was the end of the story, really. What did we do? Off we go. Theory of constraints. Exploit the constraint. Management attention. Silly small investments. And yes, it's not, it happens very often. It was one, one thing that helped was a new photocopying machine because the one in the quality, compart quality control compartment was broken and they had to use the one from accounting that was uh, 400 yards away. And when accounting was doing its end of the month, they had to queue and to do whatever and stuff like that. We increased manpower by four people out of 400 for just one month. Uh, and not hiring in, you can't hire for quality control, you just transferred some people who are machining parts that you didn't need and did some quality control. And we started aggressively reducing whip. Uh, we didn't go straight to drum buffer rope, and we don't go straight to drum buffer rope in environments such as that, because they have so much excess whip, right? I don't know if it's four times or ten times too much, right? Uh, we'll come to that in a second. We use the two for one rule, okay? And, and later we cut batch sizes. The two for one rule uh, is uh, something that we, we started using about uh, eight years ago and has now become a standard of what we do. It's neither theory constraints nor lean or whatever you want. It's just common sense, right? You have a factory with too much stuff in it, so more must go out than comes in. Full stop. It's as simple as that. And before getting into any complicated theories, when you have so much garbage in there, nine months worth of work, okay? It doesn't matter how you do it, but you just must do it. And the simplest way we've always found is the two-for-one rule. You are not allowed to start anything new until you finish two things. Okay? You can do it with the number of parts. We often do it with work orders because it's a simple thing to do with the ERP. Okay? So when they've uh, completed two and closed two work orders, they're allowed to launch a new one. So your ERP goes mad and says, you know, this is what you should launch, this is what you should launch. And they just look at the, the, the proposals and say, that one, yeah, I, I believe that one. That I think I need. That one, what the hell is that for? That's for something in two years' time and whatever or whatever. I'll put it aside and come back to it, okay? That's all we do. And we do that very systematically because obviously none of you are like that. Very, very often we find that people have at least two, if not four times too much whip in their system 
given their, 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 their real problems. Okay? So we just need to reduce it. Okay? And if you switch directly to drum buffer rope, it's too sophisticated for the problem. We get to drum buffer rope, but later, when we've cleaned up the system. Okay? So that's you know, a very successful, simple technique, highly recommended. Uh, people love it, uh, and it gets out of any sect wars, or whether it's theory constraints or something else. It's just common sense, right? Get more stuff out of your plant than you launch. And it's incredible how easy it is and how much people love it. They, they, you need to, to, to take the cricket bat to their face to, to get them started because, you know, you're overdue uh, and stuff, and we say stop, stop launch. Uh, but uh, everybody loves it. So, uh, results. Uh, within two weeks, an increase in throughput of 30%, uh, right, with four extra people in quality control. Uh, and without any extra labor, uh, so that's a 30% increase in overall productivity. Within two months of parts, so it wasn't the machine, right? It was the quality control of the parts. And uh, things started picking up. Uh, we carried on, and within three months, uh, due date performance went from 40%. I shouldn't, have written, that's, I shouldn't have put that down. I'm officially only allowed to say that they were less than 60% when we started, but anyway, it's written now. I'll get, I'll get slapped. 40% uh, initially to over 80%. Uh, they're hitting 87% today. 70% um, reduction. When I wrote these slides, I just checked the data this morning. They're at 81% reduction now. Uh, over 2 million euro reduction in, in WIP. And the, country, the company was bleeding money worse than Tesla, right? Uh, the, the factory. Uh, and they're now slightly profitable. Uh, we've got a long way to go, but... Uh, that's the diagram of uh, whip reduction uh, in number of parts, and they were had nearly 50,000. Uh, last night's figures, they were at uh, uh, 10,492 parts. Okay, uh, and we're still working on that. Okay, so we did the two-for-one rule, then we did cut the batch sizes in half, and we're working more on that. Further on, uh, this the buzzword or the main key word for a conference this year is transformation. We do transformations. We don't think you can transform a company within you know, three months or, or, or whatever. Our projects last in uh, five years. Uh, so we've been now there for a bit over a year and we're working on, on the, the follow-up. The target is to go down to three weeks uh, and we hope to go further than that. But anyway, the target right now is three weeks from nine months. We're at uh, three months right now. Uh, due date performance, uh, end of year target is 95, uh, which we're having trouble hitting because of quality issues, which, by the way, is one of the big blind, pots, blind spots of the theory of constraints. We spend all our time talking about capacity and this and that, and we don't have anything very significant to say about non-quality issues. Uh, and uh, end of 2016, we should be hitting 99%. We've implemented critical chain. Why? Because uh, they were overdue with their new products. But worse than that, and I think this is generic throughout industry today, the products that came out were basically impossible to manufacture. They were designed by young engineers straight out of the university in front of a 3D CAD CAM system and impossible to make, which is one of the reasons why we're having trouble getting over 95%, right? Because uh, you look at them, uh, what they've designed and you think, that's interesting. I've never thought of doing it that silly way before. And so, you know, they put tolerances which are impossible and stuff like that, and it doesn't help. And we're do redoing factory layout. Uh, we're doing uh, setup time reductions. I'm sorry, in 2015, Taishi Ono said it a long, long time ago, you need to reduce setup times, but we do it nearly systematically, so people just say, yeah, yeah, yeah. We're working on capabilities in SPC because they hadn't, we're training and so forth. A lot more work going on. Uh, so within, within four months, the worst factory in the group of 5 billion uh, 60 factories became the best, okay? Uh, which surprised top management, especially after all that they'd done with it. And so they decided to have an official group-wide theory constraints day with 130 of the top managers from 40 of the 60 factories, and we spent a whole day going talking about uh, theory constraints. And by the way, uh, I said to them, right, you have 5 billion work in progress in your group. 5,000 million euro in the group, right? Let's reduce it by 50% this year, right? That would just add 2.5 billion euro to your results and if you do it right. So uh, I left them with that at, uh, just before the holidays and uh, we'll, we'll be back. We're talking about that when I get back to, to France, uh, see if they, they'll pick up on that challenge. But that's my personal challenge, see if we can reduce by at least 1 billion anyway. 
the work in progress in this, in this group. Uh, at least a dozen theory constraints initiatives have now been launched uh, throughout. Case B, uh, a large sophisticated uh, bearing or bearings company, uh, well known. These are the very, very high-end bearings, right? They have, they're in aircraft engines or helicopter rotors. Uh, the expensive ones are sort of 30,000 euro, uh, right? So, uh, and, you know, they have to work, otherwise you wouldn't want to get on a plane or you wouldn't want to take a helicopter. Uh, they, they spin around very fast, mustn't get too hot. And, um, it's, it's important for all of you to, when you get back from Cape Town to home that these things work. Um, the... Um, so they, they were, these guys didn't have the back to the wall. Often we, we were called in, you know, with people, Ugh. but they, they, they were okay. Uh, but they needed to improve due date performance, they needed to reduce their lead times, and they needed to reduce costs. Uh, just a little uh, bit of explanation about uh, a ball bearing. Uh, you've got basically the two sophisticated parts, which are the inside ring and the outside ring, okay? And between them you have the, the balls that spin around. Uh, the tolerances on the on the outer ring and inner ring, especially the inner, uh, that touch the ball, have to be very very precise when you're spinning around at 30,000 RPM and stuff. Uh, the balls have to be nice and spherical, or it's not always balls. In fact, it can be all sorts of shapes, but uh, let's, let's stay with a, a spherical ball. And then there's a, a silly little part which isn't really very important, which is a cage which just has to keep those parts in the right place, right? Very low tolerances. It's just to keep the things the, the balls not knocking into each other. Very easy to make and stuff. Okay. I mention that because, of course, uh, one of the fascinations I think everybody has with regards to theory constraints when they've been doing it for a while is where the constraint should be in a company, right? And you can look at it in various ways, but even looking at that, that diagram, you should start thinking, where would I put the bottleneck in that company, okay? Well, off we went, and uh, guess what? They wanted to do theory constraints, they did a goal, they tried, uh, and they said, it's not, doesn't work, uh, come and have a look and they got the bottleneck wrong. Okay, where did they thought? Well, you know, uh, the only difference between a child and an adult is the cost of his toys. So they said, my expensive milling machines are the bottleneck. And so they'd done all the theory constraints applied to the milling machines. In fact, it was in the corner of a factory, a little old machine that did the cages, you know, the easy, simple stuff, which nobody thought about because it wasn't, it didn't cost a lot, it was easy to do, and whatever, whatever. So, that's the, again, uh, uh, that was a, a four-hour diagnostic. We found the, the constraint, and off we went, theory of constraints. Uh, the real constraint was identified, the bottleneck was elevated. All that we needed to do was just say it. Management attention was sufficient. These guys, you know, they, they just never went to that part of the plant. When I went to see the, the people, they were really surprised to have management attention. Oh, what, why have you come here? You know, we're in the, we're in the backwaters of the factory. Uh, nobody comes to see us. Uh, and, uh, and off we went. You know, we didn't even have to invest any money. Uh, so that increased by, phew, you'll see the figures, a lot. Uh, as we did that, they had uh, a, an external subcontractor that became, uh, quickly became uh, the, the second constraint. Uh, that was dealt with very simply. I said, there are five of you in the management committee. Each one of you will go every morning to uh, the department manager went on Monday, supply chain manager on Tuesday, uh, the financial director on Wednesday and stuff. So until the subcontractor got the message that uh, we would no longer um, uh, accept overdue orders. Uh, and that got rid of that problem. And then the rest of the plant was subordinated, fair enough. Uh, global productivity increased by 10% per month for the first four months. That's over 50%, 700 person plant, 10% uh, per month, okay. Uh, the order backlog was uh, dealt with. The end of the month hockey stick was eliminated. By the way, again, none of you in this room have this problem, but at least 60% of the companies I work with have a hockey stick phenomena. And I, you know, it's, it's wild because even today, which just shows how unfortunately Elia's ideas haven't been uh, are not known, people don't know why they have a hockey stick phenomena. The number of people who tell me I have a hockey stick phenomenon because my order book has all, all the orders at the end of the month is wild. You know, I, whenever I hear that, I jump on it and say, okay, I'll bet you $10,000 that's wrong. We'll have a look at the order book. And they, they don't accept that. So I, I, I bet a Malabar, which is a, a 50 cent suite in France, and I, I've got a lot of those on my desk. Um, 
Anyway, so we got rid of that because, you know, local optimums against global optimums and stuff. They spend all their time firefighting. That disappeared, and they start dealing with a number of underlying issues that were significant. So that, uh, that, went, that went well. Uh, in this case, it was easy to, to decide how to organize on the long term. The best constraints were, indeed, the milling machines, those that they thought were the bottlenecks, so now we've reorganized that. And we've got a mixture of drum buffer rope and simplified drum buffer rope according to the channels and the capacity. And now we're going to talk about ball bearings, the small ones. I'm sorry, I do do other things in life than deal with ball bearings. It just, uh, I like the story. I, I, I do know other things, but the, 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 these are small little ones, only sort of, sort of 50 euro stuff. Uh, and the reason I'm going to talk about this one is just because I, I'm always upset when I hear how people consider that theory constraints is so difficult to do. And I think it's easy to do, personally, and, 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 and with or without a consultant. And this one is nice because they, there's no horrible consultant. Um, a large, well-known uh, ball bearing manufacturer. Uh, this guy, just in a, one of the factories, in charge of uh, 60 people at the time, uh, read the goal, heard about this training program, came to a two-day course about you know, applying the goal, uh, talking theory of constraints in production, how you identify the constraints, how you implement drum buffer rope and all that stuff. And so off he went after a two-day course, and then he phoned me up 18 months later, later and said, well, okay, uh, can you come and have a look, please? Uh, I just want to make sure I got everything right. Um, when he implemented it, all on his own, uh, in a lean company, uh, or rather Six Sigma, then a little bit of lean, you know, the number of belts you have is um, a good sign of your career e expectations. Um, it was at 70% due date performance. And he got to 100.000. Uh, there were no orders late anymore. Um, the whip reduction wasn't that significant. We, we do often do more than that. But that's because they had already pretty good pressure on uh, reduced whip. Right? They, were, they were lean. Uh, so uh, that was, there wasn't, there wasn't uh, 10 times too much. But they reduced it some. Product 4% of plant-wide, uh, and uh, in, within the company, it's, it's, it's been noticed in particular because those sorts of performances, right, that's zero orders late now, uh, is very appreciated by the aircraft manufacturers. It's just very reassuring because they have so much trouble ramping up their supply chains that some, when somebody says, don't worry about due dates, we just deliver everything on time. Tell me what you want and when. We'll do it. Um, so he has a lot of, he's always been called out to go and do um, sales talks, in fact, you know, saying to, 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 to get new sales for the company. But, uh, so that's nice. Uh, and again, this is without any horrible consultants. He just went away and did it. Uh, it's plant-wide now, uh, lots of nice visual management uh, all over the place, you know, focused on the bottlenecks and what's going on. And just another point, which... Um, is something I, I, I find is, is lacking in a lot of theory constraints implementations. The in, initial change, implementing drum buffer rope is great, wonderful. Okay? The problem is the theory constraints is too powerful because you can get a very bad factory with very bad quality to produce very well and be, have a competitive edge okay? because you've buffered the system and so forth. Okay? The people, people fall asleep on their buffer, buffers, right? They say, okay, we have 100% due date performance. We've got good productivity. We've got shorter lead times than the competitors. So let's just go to sleep. Okay? They haven't. Uh, and they just you know, do proper buffer management all the time. They're watching buff buffer penetration and really thinking about what's wrong in terms of quality, in terms of changeovers, in terms of absenteeism or whatever. And that's really nice to see. And again, when people say theory constraints is difficult, I don't understand. This guy just you know, read the goal two days working out how to do it, and he's been running it ever since. Okay. Um, to conclude, uh, what do aircraft manufacturers in 2015 have to do if they want to make money? Uh, well, uh, there probably isn't an, another sector right now in the world that has such a beautiful business case, right? They've got order books in the most incredible. I mean, in the history of man, nobody's had an order book like those of Boeing and Airbus, right? hundreds of planes to be delivered over the next five, soon ten years, I don't know. It just never stops. It just gets bigger and bigger and bigger, right? Uh, but they do realize that, that their nearly monopoly, Airbus Boeing, is probably going to get more and more threatened by the new aircraft manufacturers, right? The, the Embraers, the Chinese, Koreans, Japanese, and whatever. The world is changing. 
so they have to they have to pick up. So if they want to make money a lot right now, they should just try and produce more airplanes. Anything they produce, they sell, right? That would be nice if they could you know, double their, their production rate. So increases in throughput are good. Um, they have to get, become more competitive, so they need to get their, their, their working process down and, uh, and get uh, their costs down, right? So what, does the theory, well, what is the theory of constraints good at? Isn't it very good at increasing throughput? Better than anything else in the world? In these environments where the, uh, where, where in uh, non-repetitive or, or, or slightly repetitive manufacturing, right? You can't use Kanban, you can't use any other production flow mechanism. The only of the three plants that might have envisaged Kanban was the third one, because it had fairly repetitive manufacturing. The first two, uh, I won't go into the detail of their older book, it was just impossible. Uh, they had uh, 3,000 different references. Right? Um, so, drum buffer rope, or simplified drum buffer rope, is the way to do it. Nothing else works. Okay. And, uh, right. Increases in throughput without increasing operating expenses. People here have no doubt done it. Uh, we do it. That's what theory of constraints does, right? So that's why the theory of constraints is a match made in heaven with regards to uh, airplane manufacturing. Thank you very much. Any questions?